Ever since Lech Chekunrus first left home and parted ways over 1,500 years ago, the gods that they and their children worshipped would pass through dozens of names in dozens of living and dead languages, persisting from polytheism into syncretism with Christianity, those indigenous gods becoming the saints of small religious faiths. Despite church officials declaring polytheism had died, Sapphic scholars of the 1800s rediscovered the original names and preserved their own contemporary folklore, laying major important groundwork, so by the first half of the 1900s, self-identified Slavic polytheists returned. In the hundred years since, the internet and the fall of oppressive regimes have allowed the official and legally recognized return of polytheism in several Slavic-majority nations, with tens of thousands of adherents across Eastern Europe, which isn't bad for a supposedly dead religion. Whether we consider the pre-Christian faith, syncretic double faith, and modern faith as one seamless tradition, or as three religions who gave way to one another, we still need to ask some major questions. What exactly is Slavic polytheism? What beliefs, philosophies, worldviews, spirits, and gods fall under this label we've been using without definition for almost 40 minutes? It's time to start exploring the question, what do Slavic polytheists believe? If one single statement could describe all of Slavic religion and history in just a single breath, it would be this. From their cultures to languages to religions, the Slavs are diverse. Slavic is an umbrella term. The Slavic world is just as diverse as the Hispanic, Arabic, or Sub-Saharan worlds. There's a misconception in America, largely thanks to the Cold War, that most Slavs are basically Russians. But that's as wrong as saying Argentinians are Mexicans. And the biggest idea to take away from this video and series is that Slavs are diverse. There is no single way to be Slavic. There are no correct and incorrect Slavs. The Slavic family is not lost or confused Russians, because Russians are just one of dozens of Slavic siblings, as distinct and unique as any other countries from any other places. Why does this matter? Because there's simply no honest way to encompass every belief from every tradition of Slavic polytheism. It's just too diverse. So many questions. Who is the sun god? What genders are the sun, the moon, the stars? Who are all the goddesses of the seasons? Who is the goddess of motherhood? How was the land created in myth? Who is the leader of the gods? Basically every concept in this family of religions has a different answer depending on where the question is asked. Not just according to modern borders, but historical regions shaped by displacements of people under Christianity and by the pre-Christian borders of hundreds of ancient tribal alliances. There has to be a place for a newcomer to begin, so this video will give answers. Typically some of the most widespread or common answers, and sometimes the answers I know the best from my heavily Polish-shaped tradition. But it must be stated that my answers are not the only answers, and this is just the beginning of a search which can last a lifetime. While upcoming videos will cover each topic in deeper detail, please go forth with an eye for what feels right for you, and keep an open mind. The gods are alive, and any educational resource is ultimately a tool for them to reach out to you. We've already discussed some of the major values held by Slavs, namely hospitality and respect, though those concepts don't perfectly translate into English. Pojona Venye and Gostinasht carry certain connotations from Slavic culture stemming back to the polytheist era. Since there are basically no words in any language which can perfectly translate to another language without losing some sort of meaning, it's important to recognize that these translations aren't one-to-one. -one. The little meanings marked into these Slavic words might be worth their own video, but for this discussion, we'll say Slavic hospitality and respect are something obligatory. Both attitudes and actions carried out because most people agree that they're just fundamentally important. This kind of default cultural view isn't super common in the United States, but they could be compared to how most Americans see freedom and liberty as guaranteed facts of their society. Even if the country is deeply divided on what freedom and liberty really mean, culture is complicated. Beyond these two important values are a few more general concepts that we should finally say aloud, even if they might seem obvious at first glance. Polytheists believe in multiple gods, but the implications of that can vary drastically. Many Slavic polytheists share the view common to ancient Europe and West Asia, that the hundreds of gods from dozens of religions are all real in some way. 
The idea of a one true religion was mostly invented by Christianity, while the religions before Christianity acknowledged the multitude forms of divinity, just as sometimes making their own arguments for why their local divinities should be worshipped over some of the others. So an ancient polytheist might value their own gods more highly, but they still would recognize the existence of the other gods, and they frequently adapted gods from other religions into their own. Pantheons, as we now imagine them, were built over time, as city-states or tribal alliances traded their local gods with one another until everything collected into a larger tradition. In this diversity in the ancient world, what a god even is would vary across regions and religions, and within a single religion over time. Greek gods, for example, are named Theoi, and different groups of Greeks like Stoics, Platonists, Cynics, etc. would disagree on what their gods were and how a society should interact with them. Theoi basically derived from words for placing or doing, so Greeks more or less called their gods the doers or placers, translating roughly. Unlike modern pop culture, which shows the Greek gods almost as superheroes, a being with one physical body and incredible powers, the historical Theoi were more accurately seen as something like a non-material mind which was present within their entire domain. So Zeus was the source of thunder, fatherhood, and leadership, so he would be present in lightning itself, in the actions of fathers, and within expressions of leadership like government meetings. Their non-material nature is how they could live on Mount Olympus despite clearly not physically being on Mount Olympus, and how they could travel anywhere, take disguises, or speak into the minds of mortals. The bodies given to them by art and mythology were just metaphorical facsimiles of much more complicated beings. Stories which give them steady bodies are using those bodies as symbolism and as metaphorical tools. So things like Kronos eating his children, who become fully grown in his gut, or Zeus giving birth to a fully armored Athena from his own mind aren't any more or less literal than stories of mortals meeting the gods face to face. Mythology was not meant to be a perfect, literal description of things that happened, it meant to convey the general important ideas. So apart from their incredible, almighty power over the the reality, the Greek gods didn't exactly have fixed bodies the way that pop culture has come to see them with now. To understand Slavic religion, we need to understand how Slavs saw their own gods, because they didn't see them as superheroes either, but they also didn't necessarily see them the way that Greeks saw the Theoi. The Slavs named their gods Bogovie, roughly meaning the sources of luck or givers of fortune. Their gods are defined not as doers in general, not as the source of everything and present everywhere, but primarily as forces which cause the good and bad things that happen in life. This is open to interpretation, but when this is combined with artistic depictions from Slavic idols and ideas of cosmology and philosophy gleamed from folklore, we can start to piece together how Slavic gods were seen by their first worshippers. Said simply, the polytheist tribes were animists, meaning that they thought every animal, plant, and even natural force like a storm was given its own type of soul. While the animals and humans and plants are different, they're also equal to one another, and their mutual existence can be seen as a sort of meta-democracy. Hundreds of minor spirits and ghosts personified not only plants and rivers, but things like the stove, the bathhouse, the rainbow, the concept of midday, precious stones like amber, the coldness which causes sickness, the sense of belonging at home, and even the home itself as a building. Everything in the Slavic world was seen as a living spirit and as the real physical object which that spirit inhabited. The guardian of the forest was also the forest as the whole, but each tree and river and rock and mushroom in the forest was also seen as its own little spirit who was just one part of the larger one. The animism of the Slavs was the context to their theology, and the Bogovie, the givers of luck, were parts of nature too, and parts of that same chain of mutual respect. Animals must respect nature, or they starve, and humans must respect animals and nature alike, or they starve, and the gods respect humans, animals, and nature. All of nature is built on this chain of mutual care. The gods wish to care for humans and look after them in much the same way that so many humans wish to care for cats or dogs or sheep or cattle. The multitude of divine, semi-divine, and non-divine life are different beings of equal worth, all populating a larger life in which everything thrives the most by respecting and helping the other. So we see the gods not as almighty or all-powerful, not necessarily 
necessarily omnipotent nor omnipresent, but as just another type of living thing, which are given their own role and their own abilities beyond what we as humans can do, just as we as humans have our own roles and abilities which are different than those from animals, and animals to plants, to plants to objects. Just as animals can befriend humans, and the two can share a mutually helpful, healthy, and genuine friendship, humans can do similarly through worship of the Bogovie. Everything in reality is its own sort of family on the largest big scale. Just as Slavs value democracy and hospitality among each other, and extended hospitality to any well-meaning strangers they met, that same commitment to hospitality and respect was also extended out to nature as a whole, not just humans. And those same rules of respect and hospitality which bound humans together, and bound humans with animals, and humans to the places they lived, are also built between humans and the Bogovie. On that largest level, just as there are rules of respect which people must adhere to when they visit an other's home as their guest, you could say humans have a similar obligation as guests in the homes of the Bogovie. Most of the idols and sacred art of the Bogovie that we know from history were depicted with several faces on a single body. Multi-faced gods dominated the artistic output of the Western Slavs, and while fewer idols survived in the East and South, their folklore seemed to blend ideas of several-faced gods into gods who are siblings which all share one large domain, many faces for one concept, rather than many faces carved on a single torso. Slavic Bogovie are examples of pluralistic polymorphs, meaning that a single god had a many separate faces to speak from, and each face could be seen as a separate god, while also still being a component of a larger deity. One face might be friendly and compassionate, while another is stern and rigid. There is no evil or holy, because every god has a capacity to harm and a capacity to help. The givers of fortune can equally take it away, and the faces of the gods reflect the many different manifestations of their attributes, the complexities and nuances of their domain, and the shifting and changing nature of the gods themselves. Nothing in life is ever static. Even the seasons and the earth itself grow and change as the year progresses, and the gods are no exception. They always have a common, consistent core to them, but the details of the gods, the faces that they put on, the specific forms that they take, can vary changing on what's needed. This trait is found in other religions to an extent. For example, Mother Kali can be seen both as a nurturing, protective mother and a fearsome goddess of death. Her domain might seem contradictory to a Westerner, but both are equally her. While Hindus and Egyptian comedics tended to express these ideas by giving different forms of their gods their own titles, sometimes the son of Ra was also just another version of Ra, Slavic symbolism basically went one step further and depicted the whole being including the smaller components all at once. Greeks might be reminded of their fates, who split one domain equally between three sisters, or of Hecate, who is often represented as a young girl, adult woman, and elderly crone, combined to a single greater whole. An idea similar to such triple gods can be seen on a much larger scale with basically every Slavic deity. We'll explore this more as we look at individual gods, but many tribes knew unique local gods with unique local labels who were very similar in both name and function to dozens of other gods, and it often seems, maybe not always, but frequently, that these might not have been just regional gods, but regional forms or faces of a wider spread deity that became individual patrons to individual settlements and communities. This understandably might be a little confusing to people who aren't used to this type of idea, but the best advice is to just resist the modern impulse to place a deity in a box or label them singularly. Deities aren't superheroes. Just interact with the god the way that you feel drawn to, and they'll help you understand which face or sibling or name they want you to use in your own relationship with them. Your relationship to that god might be very different from the relationships other people foster with them, and they might even seem like they contradict each other, but that doesn't mean that either of you are wrong. The Bogovie are just incredibly different from most modern pop culture ideas of divinities. They're incredibly complicated. If something's confusing, don't worry about it. There are lots of things that humans do every day that go right over the heads of the animals they befriend. Your cat probably doesn't understand things like like the economy, crippling debt, 
or why you're so anxious about war happening in another country. They don't have concepts like that, but they can still emotionally understand you and know when you need comfort. And in that same way, we might not understand everything about the divine, but we can connect to them on an emotional level. Historically, hundreds of tribes and tribal alliances each held their own few patron deities, and each had their own variants of the family of gods and spirits. But regardless of the immense diversity between Slavs, no matter where you went in their world, a handful of deities would tend to be worshipped almost everywhere. Some scholars call these the Pan-Slavic gods. I'll just usually refer to them as widespread. And we'll go on to a few of the most widespread and significant Slavic Bogovie. Across hundreds of years of Christian accounts, the most prevalent idea we see is a sky god who holds a special authority higher than most others and who creates lightning. More often than not, this figure is Perun, whose name grew from ancient words for flying or striking quickly, and this later became the word for lightning. Perun is the patriarch or king of most or many other gods, but this is according to concepts of kingship created by the Proto-Slavs, which we discussed last video. These were warriors who would get elected by democratic communities to serve on a federation's democratic council, who then elected the king of the tribal alliance. Rather than valuing birthright, wealth, or absolute might, they elected representatives and kings according to lived experience, preferring community elders. Through the values of those higher-ranking warriors who swore their oaths to Perun, we see his domain over wisdom, dedication to community and family, and the creation and maintenance of the laws of society. A god whose steady rulership maintains the very bedrock of civilization. Sometimes called the god of war, his domain might better be summarized as the god of defending the family, the giver and maintainer of morality, law, and wisdom, the source of lightning and a giver of fire, a wise, inexperienced god of passions, compassion, wit, wisdom, a fast temper, and the fiery drive of the heart to do what's right and protect the people you love. Perun was associated with the color red, worn as a color of protection even in modern Slavic countries, along with axe-shaped pendants worn by both warrior devotees to Perun and by civilian family members, including children. And the rosette, or sunflower, little rose, or little sun, which was carved or painted on the exteriors of buildings, especially over doorways, would cast the protective light of Perun over the household and keep the family safe, though it can also be associated with other gats too. White Birds, the oak tree, and the sun in the sky remained popular symbols meant to evoke him, even centuries deep into Christianity and double faith. You could say that his symbolism has left a bit of a lasting mark on Slavic culture. But just as each day eventually gives way to night, only to repeat, the darkness to Perun's light is the god Veles, whose name can loosely translate to the damp one or woolly one. While Perun rules over the sky, Veles dwells deep in his afterlife, where he tends to the spirits of dead polytheists, like a rancher tends to their beloved cattle, or a forester tends to the familiar wildlife. On Earth, Veles holds domain over livestock and domestic pets, along with wild creatures like bears and wolves. Personifying the damp and dark places of the world, he is the source of magic which flows so strongly through wetlands, swamps, and caves, and creatures like reptiles and amphibians who dwell in his domain can pass through his secret caves to enter and exit the afterlife freely. But despite his role caring for the afterlife, Veles is typically not the god of death itself. It would be more accurate to call Veles the god of the unknown, of ambiguity and uncertainty, a god of change and the disorder and chaos that follows the ending of stability, a shifting counterforce against Perun's steady order. To quote a community member who I think explained him well, we could simplify the role of Veles as a god of the unknown, of the potentials beyond perceived boundaries of culture. One will find his essence in the depth of the forest, eternally darkened by treetops and foliage, where people found food and medicinal herbs, but could easily be devoured by wild beasts, or poisoned by berries and mushrooms. He is also deep in the underground, as the god who resides in mines, where one can be crushed by digging, or poisoned and suffocated by underground gases, or awarded with pressure precious metals and gemstones. Similarly, he resides in the other world, the place unreachable to the common folk. Veles has much to do with the unknown which is just past the threshold, the uncertainty just out of view, the unknown creature in the tree line who avoids your light, and the final uncertainty of death. 
To live life is to confront the unknown, and receive whatever curses or blesses are obscured by that mystery, and the essence of the mystery which gives way to either fortune or failure is Veles. Christians likened him to the devil, though it's interesting that even in their stories, the devil took all souls when they died and could be just as helpful as he was harmful. Some modern polytheists link him to evil, but evil wasn't really an idea known to ancient Slavs. Like the winter or the night, Vele simply is. He exists as an opposite to Perun, and he is the god of domains which conflict with Peruns, but that doesn't make either of them good or evil, god or Satan. Early scholarship was quick to paint the two as sworn enemies, but while that might have been true for some tribes, especially some in the east, we can now see more nuance to their relationship, and many polytheists today have come to see Veles and Perun as having something closer to a sibling rivalry. Between the brothers of orderly lightness and uncertain darkness, our third deity is Mokosh, his name derives from water, who might or might not be connected to another goddess, Matka Shemya, literally motherland. Some polytheists maintain the two are separate goddesses, some that they're the same, and some that they're are two faces of a single larger divinity, and those questions will get explored in another video. For now, we'll keep it more general. Whether one deity or two, Matka Jemya is a goddess of vegetation, fertile soil, and growth. The mother of life itself, since all plants grow from her earthly womb, and all other life relies on her continual renewal of nature. Likewise, especially to East Slavs, some traditions see her as the goddess of death, with all life returning to her soil, to be recycled and remade into another generation of life. Mokosh is also a mother goddess of life, but more in regards to human and animal motherhood, pregnancy, and childbirth. Within matriarchal tribes, she was also the goddess of matriarchy and the unbroken line of mothers. In that time before Christianity, before the expectation for all women to just become mothers, there were some women who had become warriors, some merchants or artisans, and those women who chose motherhood did so religiously, opting into a sacred cult of motherhood. Within these cults of Mokosh were fertility and sexual rights, both heterosexual and homosexual, between her priests and priestesses. We don't know much about what these fertility cults did specifically, since Christian descriptions were either too disgusted by them to give any details other than sinful fortification, or they went into so much extraneous detail that those Christians probably didn't know what they were talking about, and were making up extra details just to further demonize the sexual cults. Through most forms of dual faith, those more sexual connections became obscured, but her connection to motherhood mothers and her role in cooking and kitchen magic and the craft of sewing and embroidery endured through Christianity, surviving until now. The expression of the motherland and the vital role that Mary tends to play in Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism both tie to this cultural memory of the importance of the mother goddess. Early in the 1970s through 1990s, when academia on Slavic polytheism was finally just starting to take off, the early scholars imagined Veles, Mokosh, and Perun as characters in a tragedy, with Veles kidnapping the wife of Perun and holding her hostage in the underworld, until Perun came to the rescue with his lightning, explaining both the origin of their conflict, the seasons, and the storms. While this story did genuinely seem to exist in at least a few tribes, probably mostly in the east, it now seems very unlikely that it ever existed on a larger panslavic scale, both because it meshes awkwardly with the goddesses of the seasons found in the west and south, and because the conflict doesn't really mesh with the lack of good or evil, or the values of polygamy which we know the Slavs practiced. The more popular current reading is that Veles and Perun are both husbands to Mokosh, and from their various unions arise many of the other gods. The triple association between them might even be seen in one of the three surviving variants of the Slavic creation myth telling how the earth as we know it originated. Several of these renditions survive, but I'll tell the one I know the best, originating from Poland. All others are fairly similar, but also have a few important differences, the same way gods differentiated between tribal traditions. In the beginning, there was nothing but the sky, the sea, the god who sailed in his boat, and the devil emerging from the sea foam, who sat down beside god. In some variations, god is a white bird, like an eagle or dove, and the devil is a dark bird, or a stork, goose, or water bird. The devil wished to create the world, but couldn't do it alone, so he suggested it to god, who agreed to his plan. The devil dove beneath that primordial ocean, and surfaced with either a handful or mouthful of sand from the bottom. 
God took the sand and threw it onto the water, and it grew into the very first land, so thin that the two barely fit beside each other on it. God and the devil lived on this land, and once God had fallen asleep, the devil decided to push him into the water to make more room for himself. But when he pushed the sleeping God, the land beneath him grew. The devil pushed, and his legs slid back from his struggle, making more land to the west instead of allowing his falling into the ocean. And while God was pushed, instead of falling into the water, more land grew beneath him to the east. Eventually, God awoke and caught the devil in a scheme, and the two creators started to fight. So God flew to heaven, produced his lightning, and knocked the devil off the land deep into the abyssal primordial sea. Obviously, the names and details have been changed by Christianity, but we can make out the general form of Velez and the devil, and we can make out the form of Perun and the lightning-throwing white bird who establishes order, and we see both gods as equals, two mutual creators who needed each other to begin the world. Their statuses, good and evil, are clearly impacted by Christianity, but the equality of both creators relative to each other managed to survive Christianization. We can also spot Matka, Jemya, and Mokosh, a goddess of water, giving metaphorical birth to the land itself through the passions of her husbands. In some versions, such as a poem from Czechia, the boat itself is an oak tree instead, tying to another similar belief of the Slavs. Some viewers might be familiar with the World Tree of Nordic Mythology, a semi-metaphorical cosmic tree which held the Nine Realms and its various roots and branches. The Slavs also knew their own type of world tree, but in a much simpler form. At the top of their world tree are the branches in the sky, typically the home of Perun. In the, the middle is where the trunk soil, meets the soil, grasses where grasses and brushes give food and, give food shelter, and shelter and life, life representing, representing that domain, that domain of, of Mokosh. And, and at the, the bottom are the roots, the dark, moist soil, down to the home of Veles and the afterlife he cares for. In an alternate version of the tree from further north in places like Pomerania, Mokosh can be seen as the roots in the trunk, Perun as the lower branches where birds roost, and Veles as the furthest tip of the tallest branches, where the top of the leaves fade away into the Milky Way, and the stars eventually lead to the afterlife. It's not entirely clear which orientation of the tree is the older version, and it's possible that both are equally old, but just originate from different tribal traditions from the same time. Along with the three spouses are a few other important but increasingly complicated and varied divinities. Both of the Ryanais and Rad were clearly important, but their functions are complicated and commonly debated. Rad is a linguistic root, which means family, so Rad is likely the god of family. But what his domain specifically means and what he does or doesn't do isn't very clear. He likely relates to the values of respect and hospitality, and some scholars conclude that he exists within the customs themselves. The Slavs were eager to spread their family and marry spouses from new cultures to connect their culture to new people. So Rod could be related to marriage, or fertility, or parenthood, or really anything. Some researchers identify him as a god of the hearth or household oven, which could make him the same as the minor household spirit named the Domovoy, who both personified the oven or the home and lived inside it as a small goblin-like creature. There's so many different ways to read Rod that this video doesn't have enough time to scratch the surface. The Royanice are a group of sisters, numbering anywhere from three to nine, who have something to do with Rod and who all share their domains over fate and the matriarchal line of mothers, which are also traits identified especially with the eastern Mokosh, so this all gets really complicated. The Royanais are represented by sowing, and at the birth of a child they began sowing their fate, and potentially come to earth to show themselves to people shortly before major life-changing events. So they're best probably understood as goddesses of fate in a big picture sort of way, and this concept of fate has more flexibility than it does in other religions. It might be better just called a fortune. Additionally, there was another sort of goddess called Adola, who personified fate and were said to be assigned to children at birth, who then accompanied the child throughout their lives as they grew into an adult as a constant and visible companion, helping to ensure that everything was playing out how it should. Though the relationship one had with their own Dola could affect how fortunate they were. So again, Slavic fate seems to be a lot more flexible than fate in other systems, more the product of the respect and relationship built between a person and the various goddesses of fate than a more rigid predetermined force. But all this said, the exact relationship between the Dola and the Royanis aren't certain, and rather than working together, they might have just been two regional variants or equivalents. We just don't really know. 
Also important are Svarag and his sons, but the names and identities of his children or child are highly contested. We know for sure that Svarag is the god of fire, but the single historical account even describing him is highly flawed, mixing the attributes of the Greek and Egyptian gods so much that it's hard to even tell what the author is trying to say. But we know Svarag was authentic because his son, Svarozik, literally child of Svarag, is frequently mentioned through a variety of sources. Svarovi seems to be the god of fire like his father, but his father might be the god of the sun, while he himself might be the fire that the sun sends to earth, or there might be something else going on. The exact nature of how they differ isn't certain. He seemed to be a war god associated with the forging of weapons, but this association comes from the Slavic Far West, where most gods gained war attributes thanks to the 300-year war between their tribes and the Holy Roman Germans and Danes, so we aren't sure whether war was a core attribute of his, like how war is a core attribute of the domain of the Greek Ares or Roman Mars, or if it was an additional attribute, simply gained through existing through wartime. Svarozik is also less of a proper name and more like what the English call a nickname, a name of endearment, so it might be a title for a god with another name altogether. From there, scholars sometimes point to the attributes of fire and war and declare that Svarovik is a title or polymorphic face of Perun or of Dazbog or Kors, two other gods associated with fire and more prevalent in the east. We also have accounts that Svarovik is the patron deity of the city of Rydigost among the Polobians, but we have other accounts of a separate deity of fire, generosity, and hospitality, who also happens to have the name Rydigost Radagast himself. So is Rydigost the name of Svarovik? Or did Svarovik come to be named Rydigost in honor of the city that Svarovik was patron of? It's incredibly unclear. Could Rydigost and Svarozik be two faces of the same larger god? Could they be two faces of Perun, or Dazbag, or Kors? Most of these interpretations have fairly solid arguments in favor of them, and he stands as really the quintessential example of how confusing the diversity of the regional views and interpretations of Slavic polytheism can get. And again, he's worth an entire video on his own, just to try to explain each of those perspectives in full. The Slavic East knew several different traditions of seasonal goddesses, from Mokosh controlling the seasons alone, to possibly four or more minor goddesses dividing the year. But in the western south, we see two goddesses divide the year, Jevana and Marjonda, the goddess of wilderness and summer, and the goddess of agriculture, winter, dreams, and death. Both goddesses were known to be major patrons of several tribes among the southern Polobians and southern Polans. The Lachetic state happened to be founded in an area containing vast forests and groves that the ancient people believed to be inhabited by Diana, and that Diana claimed power over. Ceres, on the other hand, was considered the mother and goddess of the harvests the country needed. Therefore, these two goddesses, Diana, in their own language called Jevana, and Ceres, called Marjana, enjoyed a special cult and devotion. Both goddesses are preserved in the holiday ritual named the Drowning of Marjona, enacted on or around the spring equinox, which both marks Marjona's return to the afterlife and Jevana's return from the afterlife to bring back spring and summer. It was still in my memory that on White Sunday they drowned an idol, one having dressed a sheaf of hemp or straw in human clothing, which was shown around the whole village at the nearest lake or puddle. After removing the clothes, they threw it into the water, singing mournfully, Death twists at the fence, let us seek trouble. Then they would run home from that place as soon as possible. Whoever fell then had this prophecy that he would die that year. They called this idol Marjona, Jaivana as Diana. Over time, Marjana gave her name to a multitude of spirits, ghosts, and demons in Christianized folklore, all deriving from her name, which itself derived from words for death. Her role as the goddess of winter is inherently linked to her role as goddess of death and of sleep, since the Slavs saw death and sleep as very similar things. When one slept, they believed the soul could wander from the body, much like it does in death, but only temporary, and those who dreamt of being animals or fighting spirits in their sleep were thought to really 
really be doing so, as their spirits roamed free and interacted with others. The connection between the wandering soul and illusions and deceptive magic isn't directly seen in historical records, but it is reflected by Marjana basically being used as a word for crazy or insane people in several languages today. As the divine meaning of her name faded, her magical power over dreams, illusions, and deception became the part of her which many people remembered the most, probably because magic really scared Christians. Meanwhile, Jevana, goddess of wilderness, wildlife, and hunting, gave her name to a plant, which in English is called mullen, collected historically for use in medical remedies for respiratory and digestive infections, but don't use it if you're pregnant. Along with goddesses of wilderness and agriculture are the goddesses above them, the Zorjas. Their names literally translating to dawn, Zorja can actually describe the low light at the beginning or the end of the day. And Zorja is sometimes a single goddess, but most often two to three sisters, representing morning and evening, morning, noon and evening, or morning, evening, and night, though some regions number them at four or even more. The Zorja sisters share the domain of daylight, but divide it according to the changing personality of the day as time progresses. Folklore places the Zorjas on an island or mountain where they live with either the sun or the moon, who might be their lover or spouse, though the variants of this outnumber the number of Slavic languages. The sun and moon are also given divine personifications. In most of them, the sun is a young lady and the moon is a young prince, who court and chase each other as their love pulls them across the sky, but some regions might swap their genders or add tragedy to their mythology. And if you heard the sun is feminine and wondered whether that contradicts the sun god brothers we mentioned earlier, it doesn't. Since the personification of the sun might not be the same as the god of the sun, we see something similar in Greek Hellenism, where Artemis can be called the goddess of the moon, but Selene is also a more literal personification of the moon, because religion and mythology are complicated. The Georgia sisters, or the polymorphic Georgia goddess, and her sun and moon lover or friends sometimes also live alongside other stars, who folklore treats as a wide variety of ladies and princes, and some of these stars might be the children of more major gods, but that's a rabbit hole for another video. With most of the Panslavic gods already brushed over, we'll take a look at just a few prevalent regional gods. Kreshnik, Yarilo, Jerzy, and Yarnik are four youthful gods who tend to be overlooked in Panslavic discussions, surviving today mostly in Slovenia and parts of Kratia. Each of them are typically interpreted as the children of other gods, like Kreshnik, the son of Perun, who is sometimes otherwise interpreted as another face of the greater polymorphic god, is the god himself of the summer solstice, the god who pulls or escorts the sun across the sky, and is another creator of life lightning and summer storms. He lives atop the mythical glass or crystal mountain, where he might roam his wilderness as a stag or ram with golden horns, along with his wife or priestesses typically named Vesna, they themselves a symbolic of fertility and spring. Yarilo goes on a symbolic journey of birth, death, and rebirth each year, a young boy personifying the start of spring, the growth of summer, and his fall to the underworld in the autumn, and his time he spends alone with Veres every winter. And Jerzy and Yarnik are two brothers who personify opposites, one a hero associated with spring and summer, snakes and the thriving of life, and the other the shepherd of wolves, roaming the winter with his deadly flock. Both brothers locked in a cycle of struggle or betrayal, which can vary according to the region or storyteller. Depending on how we define a god, the south has at least a dozen more, but we can move on from that region for now because they interlap with each other pretty heavily. Back in the north among the West Slavs, folklore shows us dozens more gods, from the Lord of Snakes to the Golden Stag, who might or might not relate to Kreznik or Purun, to the Ocean Princesses and the Amber King, to the King of Time and the Twelve Gods personifying the Twelve Months of the Year. But even setting folklore aside, the Polobians, Pomeranians, and Polans give us the most written material about any of their gods. Through Danish, German, and Polish Christians, we learn about a dozen more gods that tested by historical record, and dozens more hinted at through folklore. We've already alluded to the gods of the Polobians, famous for their idols with many faces, from Rugavit, the roaring deer god of sex and war, to Chernoglav, the black-haired god of victory and the very last Polobian god to have his temple destroyed. But of them all, the most famous is likely Chernobog, the black god, who is probably the most highly debated and controversial of all Slavic gods, thanks to the especially heavy Christian 
been biased in our accounts of his worship. If he really was his own god and not a title or misrepresentation of another god like Veles, then Sornobog was likely the god of misfortune or bad luck. Among the Polans, apart from Jevana and Marjona, it seems that the most prevalent patron was a goddess named Leila, Lada, or Gigi Leila, who's probably the second most controversial Slavic god, seemingly mostly because she's only attested by Poland and Czechia, which apparently made a lot of 20th century Russian scholars very grumpy. With her name meaning harmony or consent, Lada is the goddess of springtime fertility, the goddess of beauty and femininity, of weddings and young love. She herself more taking domain over the emotions and aesthetics which lead to motherhood and the creation of a child, while Mokosh herself more takes direct domain in the physical fertility and physical act of childbearing and childbirth. The Polish lily, an archaic Polish word for the planet Venus, and a variant depiction of the Slavic tree of life are all named for her. And according to Jan Dukos, the dozens of mentions of a Slavic Venus throughout Western Slavic history are all referencing her. Those historians who refute her existence and insist she was fabricated argue that the folk songs which mention her name are actually just a pleasant sort of gibberish, not unlike singing la 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 or yo ho ho. But I just want to be honest here, I don't think that argument's good enough to prove she wasn't historical. Lots of names are evoked in folk songs, and the part of the folk song which repeats her name seems like it's evoking her the way that the name of a divinity would be evoked at the start of a prayer. I wouldn't have gone into so much detail on our regional goddess, except that I think she's a great example of modern regional bias and scholarship, and a reminder that even the professionals, especially professionals based in Russia in the 20th century, don't always know what they're talking about when they extend out of their their region of expertise and begin judging the authenticity of gods from regions with their own languages that the scholars don't have much experience with speaking. A big part of studying the possible attributes of Slavic gods is looking at the evolution of language, and it's obvious that a lot of those Russian scholars were totally unfamiliar with the modern Polish words, which seem to derive from Lada Lela. And considering their own limited point of view, the arguments they make are pretty convincing that Russians never had Lada Lela, but that does doesn't necessarily mean anything for Poles. Degrees and qualifications are incredibly helpful, but they're no guarantee that an author actually knows what they're talking about, so remember to read everything about Slavic polytheism with a critical eye for any authorship bias. From here, we could keep discussing another dozen regional gods, or we could begin to discuss the hundreds of lesser nature spirits or ghosts, but I think we can move on to a more practical conversation. If you decide that Slavic polytheism is the right religion for you, you'll probably want to learn more, and you'll probably want to meet fellow polytheists. So we should take a short look at some of the major groups and publications which you'll probably run into. The most widely accepted general name for Slavic religion is simply Slavic native faith, or more literally just a native faith, since when the words native faith are said in a Slavic language, there's an ingrained default implication that it's talking about the native faith of the language it's spoken in, and not, say, another native faith, such as the Native Americans. This label makes a lot of sense in Slavic language, but it isn't overly useful outside of Eastern Europe, mostly thanks to language barriers and the awkward way that it translates. Most Americans associate the word native with the First Nations of North America, the native Americans, so they'll generally get confused by the label Slavic native faith, even though it's technically accurate to say. Language barriers are weird. So in English, just saying Slavic polytheism or Slavic historical religion will convey that same idea. But this gets more complicated because the generic words native faith are often compounded into a proper noun, and this proper noun, generally some variation of Radnavr, is used as a self-identifier both by generic Slavic polytheists and by specific organized movements movements within Slavic polytheism, but you'll most often see it as a capitalized word specifically denoting a group of legally registered and legally officially organized religions who file government paperwork for membership and everything. Most Radnavras, when using that label as an individual person, will have incredibly diverse opinions in accordance to the rule of Slavic diversity, but the official and organized Radnavra societies will adopt official theological rules which their members need to follow, and some of these groups will just have 
weird beliefs, such as the biggest Polish Radnava group, who just declared that their main patron is one of the most poorly understood divinities. Group. There are also several of these quote-unquote official groups who have the sort of extreme political stances, such as anti-Christianity, which extends to anti-Judaism, which extends to anti-Romani, and anti-non-white immigration. And it's really ridiculous for any Eastern European to call themselves strictly white when every Eastern European is mixed with Huns and Mongols, but that's another thing. The main point is that these very vocal groups can snowball down an escalation of ideology which makes them identical to the beliefs of the ghoul and the Kremlin. In fact, a few of these groups even have connections to the Kremlin. Don't get me wrong, these people are not the majority of Slavic polytheists, but they are out there, so they're important to know about. And please be careful and keep an eye out for them. The biggest red flags you'll run into is any language which equates all Slavs as Russians, or any other rhetoric which implies there's a single correct way to be Slavic, or a single correct version of Slavic polytheism, or that Slavs are at risk of being muddled by Middle Easterners or Asians. Genetically, Slavs are a messy mix of Western European and West and South Asian. That concern that some of these people have with mixing is incredibly and entirely unfounded by history and science. It's just rhetoric to inspire political extremism. Apart from those blatantly more concerning red flags is another major one which might pass over the heads of newcomers and folks unfamiliar with it. This red flag being the citation or reliance or evocation of a book published sometime in the mid-20th century called the Book of Veles. Now there's nothing wrong with modern practitioners creating their own new mythology or interpretations as long as they're honest and transparent about it being their own modern new work. The Book of Veles was written in the early 1900s by a Ukrainian-American and presented as a long-lost ancient Slavic holy book which survived the Christian era and the destruction of old Slavic writing. Ignore the fact that the Slavs didn't develop their own written language, it's a secret lost dialect. And it's written on secret tablets which were passed, yeah, it's, it's basically the same origin story as the Book of Mormon. The issue with the Book of Veles, apart from how the opinions in it feed into that Russian centrism, is that it combines both real historical material alongside what can only be described as bad fan fiction. People who've never actually managed to track the book down or read it might assume that it's popular because it's at least well written, but it unironically has the terrible and nonsensical grammar of early 2000s Wattpad fan fiction. It's clearly written by someone who doesn't really know how to write in any Slavic language, and they're trying to reconstruct a hypothetical older grammar while not even understanding the modern grammars, so it's a mess to read. So anyone who claims the book is, or might be real, is either really inexperienced with Slavic languages and might not be the best person to learn from, or they've never read the book and only got information secondhand, so they've been misled by others, or they're just bold-faced liars. While the Book of Veles is an interesting piece of fiction, and includes real genuine folklore here and there, it's mixed together with so much blatant deception and bullshit that anyone who cites it as a real historical source is immediately suspicious. They either didn't do enough research themselves, or they know they're lying, and they're willing to lie to pass a political agenda. On a slightly less depressing note, another book you might run into is a series called The Ringing Cedars, and the sub-religion of Slavic polytheists which it spawned named Anastasianism. The Ringing Cedars book series started in the 1990s, and are supposedly collections of folklore and divine communication from a minor goddess named Anastasia, who the author met in a small village in Siberia. While the history that these books try to tell is entirely inaccurate, it seems more like it's because the author genuinely just wasn't familiar with the real history and was trying his best guess. And the fans of the Ringing Cedars books, the Anastasians, seem to understand that not all of it is true. They don't take it as 100% authentic history the way the proponents of the Book of Veles do. Instead, most Anastasians seem to be attracted to the books because they vibe or connect with the overall theological and emotional arguments. They're drawn to Anastasianism because of the appeal of the lifestyle it endorses, which is basically the Slavic equivalent to American the Amish people, living in a community that is left behind modern comforts and modern technology for life on a homestead, modeled after the ancient tribal village life. Most of the Anastasians believe in 
Soviets, or the ancient Slavic direct democracy. So they genuinely do attempt to recreate the historical values held by ancient Slavs, but they also reject modern medicine, so I can't fully endorse their lifestyles. Most Anastasian communities are strongly patriarchal, and can be really paranoid of anyone who isn't another Anastasian, so their communities share a lot of the same semi-cultish issues found with the American Amish. And the version of faith that they're trying to recreate with that strong patriarchy really did seem to exist in history for certain tribes, mostly tribes in the East, but they are not representative of all historical Slavs, and any Anastasians who claim that they are reconstructing the original or most correct version of faith in some sort of pan-Slavic sense are mistaken. So the same sort of red flag with that claim follows as the claim previous. If you live in the West, then those are really most of the communities you need to know about, since the others are exceedingly smaller and don't really step into the English-speaking world. There are tens of thousands of Slavic polytheists, but an easy 90% of practitioners just don't reach out to the English-speaking West and keep to their own Latin Slavic languages, either due to an inability to reach out through linguistic barriers or a lack of means, or to a lack of interest. Most Eastern Europeans don't expect Americans or the West to care about them, so most don't go out of their way to extend a hand to people who they don't expect to receive anything from. But in the spirit of hospitality, I at least want to try. English Slavic polytheism is still really young, and there are next to no extensive resources about it, so I hope my videos here can help to change that for the better. I love my tradition, I think it's something incredibly beautiful, and I'm happy to do anything that I can to share that beauty with new people who might appreciate it. This has been our short overview of Slavic polytheism. Next video will be our first close look at a specific deity and their mythology and folklore. If you want to learn more about any of the deities I brushed over in this video, feel free to leave a comment, and I'll try to either cover them in their own video, or if there isn't enough material for a full video, I'll at least reply to your comment to answer your question there instead. Pojeknanya, thanks for watching.